to get something hooked up right underneath the pulpit here. But thank you so much, Ms. Brenda, for bringing that back. and um, thank you for helping us in the back. We appreciate it. Hopefully we're coming through now. Um, we still got the mic here, but that's not working either. We didn't plug things back correctly, I guess, tonight from Sunday. Wasn't Sunday a blessed day? What a great time with Dr. John Reese and uh, the great teaching on American history. Uh, what a blessing that was. And uh, certainly he and his wife had a great time with us and we had a great time with them, and uh, thank you all for being a part of a great, outstanding weekend. It was a lot of fun. We had a great, great picnic also uh, on the property of Kinder Farm Park um, down there in the area of Pasadena. What a great time. Great day, great testimony, lots of great food, and quite frankly, I'm glad Fourth of July is over because all I've been doing is eating. But um, we appreciate all the fun, all the excitement and the joy we've had together. And uh, it was a great weekend, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, also, I want to encourage you while we're at it to uh, become a great um, champ for camp uh, and supporting um, a camper. Uh, also, the travel expenses of getting to camp this year with gasoline is quite expensive. We're heading towards Kobiak there in Michigan and uh, looking forward to uh, our camp ministry being very, very uh, energizing to our teenagers. So if you can help in that area, please see Pastor Mike and let him know that you have a great burden for teenagers in camp. 
and uh, you would like to help with expenses, that would be greatly appreciated. He'll give you all the details on how much a week of camp cost for a young person. I'm sure it's not under $200, but nonetheless, it's a great week that will uh, greatly enhance the life of a young person. Also, that being said, our marriage retreat is coming up. Uh, it would not be nice to have uh, the, all the couples in our church uh, take that in. This is an outstanding time. It's a great overnight experience for you and your spouse and a great time of, of getting together for three different small sessions uh, and, and a great, great fellowship time for you to bond with other couples uh, in the church family. And uh, please, if, if cost is a factor as to why you can't go, uh, let us know. We'd more than happy to help in any way. We've never wanted anybody that really has a burden to go and do something, participate in anything, to miss it because of financial problems. We would like to be a blessing. So please note the uh, Church Center app there, um, and we need to register by Sunday, July 17th. Uh, payment is due by August 1st. If that's a problem, uh, we can work with you in that area. Don't worry about that. Also, sign up for Vacation Bible School. Registration is open and uh, please uh, do so, and uh, it's going to be a great week. Uh, I guess it's called, uh, what is it called, Kookaburra, Kookaburra Coast, and uh, a little bit of, uh, sounds like we got some uh, koala bears there, we got some kangaroos there. Um, I tell you, great week ahead. Should be a lot of fun, and um, uh, don't miss it, and make sure you get out there and promote that to every uh, young person you can, age four to grades, uh, grade nine. Yes, grade nine, because we do have a great response on the part of teenagers. Sometimes between 20 and 25 teenagers come to that, and um, it's wonderful. So look forward to that. Also, uh, I think we have a, a sign-up for Go Fish on Saturday, uh, July 9th. Um, we'll be using VBS flyers in place of the door hangers to promote that and um, looking forward to just a great, great day of getting out there. And by the way, if you, if you want one of these uh, Go Fish bracelets, they're out there at the Welcome Center and you can have one wear it. And people say, what does that mean, Go Fish? And uh, it's a good thing to do. Uh, and you can use it as a witnessing tool. All kinds of people are asking questions, you know, they really are. And I was in Panera Bread today doing some writing and. Um, two ladies stopped and asked what I was doing. A person said, uh, are, are you writing a book? Uh, another one said, um, uh, are you uh, a doctor? Uh, uh, it's all kinds of questions, and I got a chance to talk to a lady that had um, rotator cuff surgery. I said, I know a little bit about that. And we had a good time, and uh, just a great, great uh, opportunity to witness. Just put yourself out there. Let people see what you're doing. Um, you know, we are epistles known and read of all men. And um, so get out there and let people know what you're doing. You don't say a word. Just be out there um, and let people read your life and what you're doing. Great opportunity to witness, all right? And uh, we're grateful for that. Um, let's look tonight at our prayer prompter and... Uh, uh, if those of you that uh, I don't think, uh, it's my understanding, have not been able to download that, uh, I apologize. Uh, that may be changing shortly. Uh, but nonetheless, you can listen and you can watch and take in what we've been teaching uh, in summer school. We're still in summer school. It's uh, still in session. And we want you to uh, pass uh, summer school. We don't want you to fail. And um, being here is a great step forward uh, to moving up in the ranks of your walk with the Lord tonight. And uh, we have been learning a lot of things. And last week we launched this prayer prompter. And um, I hope and pray that you uh, have been looking at it and understanding it. And uh, last week we talked about um, uh, the first of four ways in which to uh, do things like sit, stand, 
walk and run. Um, we only got through one, uh, but that's all right. Um, I filled in my prayer prompter and left it on my desk. It only has the words I just gave you on it, but that's all right. But uh, when you learn how to sit, you need to sit hungry uh, because that's exactly what Mary did when she sat at the feet of Jesus and uh, learned of him and uh, fed on his word. Uh, we need to learn how to do that. And uh, tonight, our second thought this evening is we're going to learn how to stand holy. Learn how to sit hungry. Most of us don't have a problem doing that. When we're sitting down and uh, we're just hungry, we're just shoving it in. You know what I mean? But um, that's what we need to do spiritually, though, is feed on God's Word. It is uh, uh, likened unto honey in the Scripture. Uh, in Psalm 19, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Boy, I tell you, nothing like uh, good... I like spun honey. I'm out of it. So if you want to buy me a container of it, that's fine. The spun honey, it's great. You can just spread it right on a, a nice English muffin. It just kind of melts right into that coarse, coarse texture of the English muffin, you know, and it is absolutely delicious. Uh, that's called spun honey, and I appreciate it. And uh, But... I, Tonight, we're going to look at not just how to sit hungry, but to stand holy. To stand holy. That's our second thought on the outline tonight. And uh, let's open our Bible to Galatians chapter number 5. I referenced this this past Sunday because it dealt with freedom. And um, in Galatians chapter 5, um, Paul is writing to uh, a group of people called the Judaizers. Uh, the churches of Galatia. You'll notice that, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Galatians. That means it's a, a group of churches, not just one church like Colossae uh, or uh, Ephesus or uh, Philippi um, or Thessalonica. This is a, an encyclical letter that would be circulated to churches in the regions of Asia Minor that were being... Uh, uh, oppressed by the teachings of the Judaizers, uh, law at the expense of grace. And uh, therefore, the law, as you know, puts a person in bondage, but, uh, but grace liberates a person from bondage. Uh, law reveals the sin, remember. Uh, you look into the perfect law of liberty, and uh, you, of course, are seeing yourself as who you are, uh, the law reveals sin, but grace cleanses sin. And that's the debate that was taking place in the book of Galatians by the Judaizers' teaching of law at the expense of grace. And Paul had to straighten that out, and he writes this book of six chapters to do so. And um, in Galatians chapter 5, in verse number 1, we have a, a, a very um, uh, pinpoint verse on this area of a standing. And it's really pronounced in the first word of the, of the verse. Stand. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What does it mean to stand fast? It's the word stako. It means to stand firm. It means to stand persistent. It means to stand stationary. Don't stop standing. Don't let anything move you from your standing position. Um, it is an important principle. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. In other words, he's pronouncing freedom over bondage. Um, be not entangled again. That word entangled simply means to be held by. It's the word an echo, means to be held. Don't be entangled or held again by the yoke of bondage. That, of course, would be the law. Um, don't let the law just uh, uh, pronounce uh, your, your judgment. Allow grace to cleanse you from that. Uh, thank God for the law. Uh, Jesus expounded uh, unto his people um, 
in the law, the prophets, and writings, the things concerning himself in Matthew 24 on the road to Emmaus, those two uh, travelers with him. So Jesus, of course, knew the law very well, Matthew 5, 17, and 18. Not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law till all be fulfilled. And, of course, Jesus uh, was very well schooled in the law, the prophets, and the writings, uh, the poetical books, the prophetic books, and the law itself, the first five books of Moses and the Bible. Uh, but we are to stand fast, stand firm. Don't let anything cause you to fall. Be persistent. Don't let anyone turn you down from what you believe in. Stay stationary. And that word idea of standing fast is not a one-time reference. I want to give you a couple more references to it. Let's look at each one of them in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 if I say to you 1 Corinthians 15, you should say to me, that's the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1. Here's what Paul has to say to the church at Corinth. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. That's not bad to declare, is it? Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, notice, and wherein ye stand. Uh, stand in the gospel. Uh, stand in the good news of Jesus Christ. And that gospel is explained in verses 3 and 4 well, by the Apostle Paul. He says, For I deli delivered unto you first of all how that what? That, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And the next verse, of course, and how he what? Was buried and rose again the third day what? According to the scriptures. Don't ever renege on standing for the gospel. You are a gospel yourself. Um, you are really a work that God has done in your life that's manifesting uh, the good news that you've been saved. So really stand on that. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, uh, Romans 1.16. Paul reminded us that. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It, it was so personal to Paul that he calls it my gospel in Romans chapter 2, verse 16. He says this is God's gospel in Romans 1.1. 1, 1. He says this is Christ's gospel in Romans 1.16. And he says, by the way, this is my gospel. This is my gospel in Romans 2.16. I hope you look at the gospel as something very personal that you possess in and of yourself because of what God has done in and through your life. And you'll stand for the gospel. You'll never be ashamed of the gospel. Stand, don't be ashamed. And by the way, don't be ashamed to the gospel. Don't be ashamed to the gospel and don't be ashamed of the gospel. Stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, well, look at chapter 16, flip the page in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 13. Watch ye. Secondly, stand fast. Stand firm. Be persistent. Stationary. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Stand fast in the faith. Don't let your faith flounder. Faith needs to be firm. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be stationary. Uh, you, you certainly don't want to uh, uh, stand on something that's not. Uh, you want to stand fast in your faith. What is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. The conviction of things hoped for. The assurance of things not seen. That's what faith is, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1. God wants us to live by faith because without the faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you don't stand, listen, in the faith, stand fast in the faith, you're probably going to end up becoming an apostate. What's an apostate? It's one who has renounced the faith, one who doesn't believe in the faith anymore. I've known some people that have gone that direction, People that I went to college with, they've renounced the faith. 
They spent four years in college and renounced the faith. And I'm sure there's more than just one that has done that. I can't imagine doing that. Uh, living my entire life uh, since I've been saved as a Christian, and at the end of my life, renouncing the faith, uh, stepping down, becoming an apostate. Uh, I can't imagine that happening. But it does. And that's a shame. Uh, don't let that happen to you. Stand fast, notice, in the faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 Two references here that also talk about standing fast. Now, keep in mind when you have a guy writing about standing fast, fixed, firm, established, stationary, here's a guy in jail writing about that. And what's he say in First Corinthians, or Philippians chapter 1, verse 27? Here's what he says in verse 27. Only let your conversation... Only let your conversation, that's your behavior, your lifestyle, not just what you say verbally, but also demonstrate visibly. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That's why you need to stand for the gospel. Because you're a demonstration of what the gospel has done and what it can do in the lives of other people. Let your conversation, your way of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent from you, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, notice the importance of unity here, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You can see how the gospel and faith are woven together here and that for which we must stand as believers unified in one spirit with one mind. Look, when people hear of your affairs, what are they hearing? I got to chuckle out of this first time I heard this, but a longtime Christian friend of mine, Brother Gary McCarovich, he came up to me, the first time he ever came up to me, he said, Pastor, i got to tell you, my wife's having an affair. I said, really? He said, yeah, with Jesus. I mean, that was a great blessing to him, that his wife was really having a good relationship with Jesus. I mean, are you having an affair with Jesus? I hope so. I hope when people hear of your affairs... What are they hearing? What are they hearing about you? You are epistles known and read of all men. And people will talk, won't they? And by the way, he who talks to you will talk about you. Be careful about that. Don't listen to garbage. All right? Don't listen. If it doesn't edify, turn it off. But when people hear of your affairs, they need to be hearing good things. That's what Paul's saying about the church of Philippi. He says here in verse 27, only let your conversation, a way of life, your way you're living, be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or I be absent, I may hear of your affairs. Whether I'm in your presence or not, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast. You're not one of these up and down, in and out Christians, on and off like a light switch. You're a person that really stands fast in one spirit, in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Every one of us in this room tonight, everyone watching from home tonight, we have the responsibility to strive together. We really do for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility to enhance one another, encourage one another, edify, equip one another that we would stand fast in the faith of the gospel. Look at another passage in Philippians chapter 4. If I say to you the book of Philippians, what is the theme of the book of Philippians? It is joy. That's the theme of the book. And Paul, of course, is greatly 
encourage, rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4.4. 4. And again, I say rejoice. But look at chapter 4 and verse number 1, Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, shows you a little bit of the tight relationship he had with his church, my joy and my crown, he says, so stand fast where? In the Lord, my dearly beloved. Boy, I tell you, there's nothing like being surrounded by the Lord. I mean, that's really the greatest company you can have, is the Lord himself. He says there, stand fast where? In the Lord. When you get saved, you come into Christ. And you're supposed to stay there. You're supposed to remain there. That's the principle of abiding in the scriptures to remain, uh, stay put, uh, abide. Uh, John 15, don't come and go, um, just stay there. Stay put and stand fast in the Lord and allow him to be the focal point of your attention. Uh, that's what Paul wants to see this church do. All right, now let's go on to another passage of Scripture in the model church of 1 Thessalonians. This is the great church. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Another reference to standing fast. A lot of things we need to stand fast in. In the Lord, in, in the Spirit, uh, in the faith. Um, we got to stand fast. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And verse number 8, 1 Thessalonians 3, 8. Now, if we live, if we live, for now we live, if what? You stand fast in the Lord. Now, obviously, some people don't live very well. Um, they're kind of dying and falling off the vine, if you know what I mean. For if we live... Uh, for, for now we live if, it's conditional, if you stand fast in the Lord. And that's really a, a stay put mentality, stay there. And uh, that's a demonstration that uh, you're living the way you're supposed to be living. How are we supposed to be living? Galatians 2.20, right? In Christ. I'm crucified who? With Christ, um, right? Living in Him. Nevertheless, I what? Well, I live, but it's not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. All right? Very important that we understand uh, what Paul is trying to say to this model church, which was a good church. He had a lot of good things to say about it. He says, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And here's this passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. I tell you, you want, you want FBC to become a great church? Spend a lot of time reading these two epistles. You'll see a lot of pastor-people relationship. Uh, and, and that's a great project, by the way. Go through all the epistles. Go through the book of Acts. That'll take you a while. It was an assignment in college for me. And write down every statement that has anything to do with a pastor-people relationship such as the pastor prays for his people, the pastor loves his people, uh, the people encourage their pastor. It's all kinds of that stuff through the entire New Testament. But here in 2 Thessalonians chapter number, what is it, 2 verse 15? Chapter 2 verse 15, the Bible says this, Therefore, brethren, stand fast, there it is again, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, traditions are not bad when they're truth. And what he's saying is, I want you to hold fast to what you've been taught. I would like to think that over the years here of Fellowship Baptist Church, some people have been taught a couple things, and they've held on to them and, and um, don't let go of them. I'd like you to to, to be taught well and to retain well. And uh, I believe that we have a responsibility to teach here. 
uh, help people to learn, to grow, uh, so that they can teach other people to do the very same thing. But he's talking to these brethren. He says, just stand fast. Hold, hang in there. Don't let go. Hold on to the traditions uh, which you have been taught, whether by word uh, or our epistle, what is written and what is spoken. All right? Let me give you now a, a second thought here. Don't just stand fast. The Bible talks about the importance of standing perfect or complete or finished or brought to an end. Uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 12, uh, stand perfect. This is the word, uh, there's two words that translate uh, perfect. One is plerao, which means to be full. And the other one is teleos, which means to be complete. And this one here is the word meaning complete, teleos. Uh, Epaphras, uh, a great, great, a great character in the Bible. Colossians 4.12, uh, I believe, I, I really do, and I happened last Sunday, I think it was, or the, I think it was last Sunday, this past Sunday. I was up early and I just happened to capture a little bit of David Jeremiah's broadcast and he just started a series on the book of Colossians and um, I preached a series on that years ago and it was nice to hear him talk about Epaphras. Uh, he didn't like him, liken him as the first pastor. Uh, you know, I, I kind of think he was the first full-time pastor after uh, Paul planted the church. Uh, I, I believe Epaphras uh, became uh, the first full-time pastor of Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently, for you in prayers, here's what he prayed, that ye may stand what? Perfect and complete in all the will of God. Back in chapter 1, verse number 7, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister. Uh, I believe he was their pastor, a great servant, but in chapter 4 and verse number 12, I appreciate the emphasis that's laid there upon standing perfect and complete, look, in all the will of God. I do believe that God has a will. I believe He has a plan, uh, a decree, whatever you want to call it. I don't believe that God has multiple wills. I believe God has one will. I don't read about the wills of God. I read about the will of God. I believe it's a perfect plan that God has established from eternity past to eternity future, and that He is just um, unfolding that plan day by day uh, in our lives. Uh, my concern is that we understand uh, what, how we fit into the framework of that will of God. Uh, I don't know if you know what God's will is for your life, but uh, I do believe that the Lord uh, conditioned me uh, over the years of college and seminary um, to become what I am doing today. Uh, it's just uh, something you've got to continually be asking, inquiring about in your prayer life before the Lord and also with others because God will release and reveal His will to you through Scripture, first of all, through prayer, through preaching, also through Christian brothers and sisters that will converse with you about things, through circumstances God brings into your life and different things that happen, all of that is part of God's sovereignty, God's controlling influence in your life. And you have to ask yourself the question, and you should do frequently in your life, God, um, please unfold more of your will to me so that I know that I am doing what you have called me to do. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, right? Present your bodies. It must be a presentation, uh, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, uh, unto God, which is your reasonable service, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I don't know what word is used there for perfect, whether it's teleos or plerao, but um, one of the two, whether it's a complete will or a full will, God wants you to be a part 
of understanding what he's doing in your life. You say, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I've talked to a lot of Christians. They don't know. They have no clue what's going on. You know what? You need to really try to firm up that thing because God wants you to understand what his will is. Ephesians 5, 17. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You've got to understand that. And the way to understand that is to be in a condition whereby God can reveal that to you by being filled with His Spirit, being in His Word, being in church like tonight, causing you to think, oh, wow, that's an interesting thought. I don't even know what God's will is for my life. Does God want me to teach? Does God want me to come here and help out around church doing manual task? Does God want me to witness more in the workplace? What, what is God's will for my life? I mean, God does have a plan. He, he really does, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. You love God? Everything's working together for good for you then. If you love Him, you got to understand what He's doing because He wants to conform you to the image of His Son. That's the ultimate goal of standing perfect, Colossians 4, 12, complete, finished, brought to an end. What is the ultimate end of our perfection? It's Jesus Christ. How much do you reflect Him today? Are you Christ-like? How much do you reflect His image in your life today? Very important thought, isn't it? This is an interesting verse in Psalm 4.4. I have been uh, enjoying... um, um, my study um, on the fear of God recently, and uh, I've always enjoyed that study. But I just spent time writing notes today, a little bit more on that, and uh, Psalm 119, going slow and getting long, but that's all right. Um, in Psalm 4.4, 4, uh, a great simple verse, how are we supposed to stand? In awe, right? What does that mean? To stand in awe. Uh, maybe a little admiration. Maybe a little uh, contemplation. Psalm 4.4, 4, stand in awe and what? That's why we talk about this thing. Look, we're supposed to sit hungry, but we're supposed to stand holy. Stand in awe and sin not. I mean, what do we stand in awe of? God. I had a guy uh, say to me yesterday, he was a fellow UPSer, he said to me, I got a question for you. Are, are, are you a minister? He's a fellow UPSer. I don't work with him. He's a feeder driver. He drives tractor trailers, and he, had to, he just happened to be there when I was there, and he says, I hear you're a minister. Is that true? Um, I said, yeah, that's true. Um, he says, I have a question for you. Uh, would it be okay if I ask it to you? I said, sure. He said, I just had someone tell me the other day that you're never supposed to call... Um, a minister of the gospel, reverend. Is that true? I said, well, I I believe it is. I believe that's a a good statement. I know you're not supposed to call him father. Um, The Bible doesn't say don't call him reverend. But I said, I like to think of the pastor as as a shepherd, as a minister, a servant, um, an overseer. Um, but not as one that you're supposed to stand in awe of. You you don't revere man, you revere God. And that's the root word of reverend, is to revere. I said, I understand that the world uh, uses that title as a quote-unquote title of respect for the clergy, but I don't think it's the best word to use. I don't get offended when people call me reverend. But um, it's not the best word. He said, well, I appreciate you explaining that to me. 
I, I, and I gave him verses. I said, these are the verses you need to look at. And um, so I think Fred was greatly pleased with that. We had a good time confirming that. But you don't stand in awe of the preacher. Uh, the preacher is just a sinner saved by grace. The Apostle Paul said he was the chief of sinners. Um, he, he was a great preacher, a great apostle, but you don't stand in awe of, of man. If you stand in awe of God and you take God seriously, you'll knock it off when it comes to sinning. Knock it off, you know, don't keep doing that. You know, and uh, allow your life to be perfect. Stand in all and sin not. Verse 4. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Good verse in Proverbs, uh, Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I'm God. We need to calm down a little bit. Sit still a little bit. Stand still. Sit still. Just be still. Knock it off. Stand in awe of God, who He is. Stop sinning. You know, people cuss like sailors. You know, knock it off. You know, <laughs> you don't want that. You don't that kind of language shouldn't come out of your mouth. And remember, I was talking about my coworker uh, last week, I think, and he was on vacation. Good friend. I love him to death. I enjoy him. He, he's what I like about him. He's He's always the same, you know, his temperament's always the same. You know, I, I like that. I, I don't like these uh, bipolar people that one day they snap your head off and the next day they're smiling at you. I, those kind of people are difficult to, I mean, they're tough. So I'd rather deal with a guy like this person and um, I never know if he's watching online, so I gotta be careful what I say. But um, he was back to work today on week vacation. There it went. I yelled out across the way, calm down, calm down over there. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, I'm sorry. It was just, I wasn't even around. I, 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 about from here to you away. And, uh, but he knows, he knows that sometimes he, he struggles with that. And, but when you stand in awe of God, you don't, you, don't, you don't cuss like that. You don't do that kind of stuff. And God, if, if we stood in awe a little bit more, we would sin a whole lot less. Stand in awe and don't sin. Put yourself in an environment of holiness and you won't be unholy. You will be holy if you put yourself in the environment of holiness. Very important. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. This is the only point that I, you have to, I can tell you right now. Not going any further tonight. Jeremiah 6, 16. Very familiar verse. Chapter 6, verse number 16. Here it is. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein. And you shall find rest for your souls. But you know what they said? We're not going to walk therein. We're going to continue walking the way we like to walk. We're going to continue to walk in our sin. It's fun. We like it. There's pleasure in sin, but it's only for a season. You know, we don't, we don't need the old paths. We're just going to go the new direction, walk the new way. Well, that's not a good thing. He says, stand where? Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Very excellent verse. Look at back up to chapter 7 of Jeremiah. Oh, forward to Jeremiah 7, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, or chapter 7, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying. By the way, when you read the book of Jeremiah, you'll see that many chapters begin that way. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying. A lot of chapters begin with that statement. 
I want to hear what God has to say, not what Jeremiah has to say. A great way to introduce a chapter there. Look at verse number two. Stand where? In the gate where? Of the Lord's house. That's not a bad place to stand. Aren't you glad you're, you're not standing, you're sitting. Aren't you glad you're here tonight? In the Lord's house. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. What word? The word of the Lord that came unto Jeremiah saying, and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, and enter in at these gates to do what? Worship the Lord. That's what we're doing tonight. We're hearing the word of the Lord tonight, and we're worshiping the Lord tonight. Wow, that's a good spot, a good way in which to stand tonight. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. And then chapter 26, Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah went through a lot of suffering. You know that, don't you? I'll tell you, what a, what a great prophet. Chapter 26, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, Remember, the one who began to reign at eight years of age, king of Judah, came this word, where? From the Lord, and here's what it said. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to what? Worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, here it is, diminish not a word. Don't take away from it. By all means, don't add to it. Revelation 22. Don't take away, don't diminish from the word of the Lord. And don't add to it, just teach the word. That's what Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Great passage in Jeremiah 26 and verse number two. And by the way, Stand uh, holy. Isn't that what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 in verse number 5? He said, Moses, I want you to take your shoes off because you're standing where? On holy ground. So you got to stand holy. And that's also made its way over into the book of Acts chapter 7 in verse number 33, about what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 5, because Moses was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, but yet God, listen, God had to talk to Moses about the importance of holiness. I think also uh, Isaiah in chapter 6, uh, uh, verses 1 uh, to 6, or 1 to 8, uh, Isaiah had to learn the importance of standing in a holy place. Uh, he, he stood there, didn't he? Sure he did, in the temple. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And then you yeah, had the six seraphim. Uh, two covered their face, two covered their feet, two flew. and Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And of course that changed uh, Isaiah's life. He got a vision, got a conviction, and got results. And what a great moment that was in Isaiah's life. But let me just close tonight um, by giving you this classic. Well, let me give you this. I'll give you the classic passage of Scripture at the end. But in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, uh, a, great, a, a great testimony of standing in a holy place. Psalm 24, let's begin in verse number 1. The earth is the Lord's, isn't it? And the fullness thereof, isn't it? The world and they that dwell therein. Look at verse 2. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Look at verse 3 and 4. Question. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? In other words, the presence of God. Who shall stand in what? His holy place. Here it is. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, 
nor sworn deceitfully. That's the person who spends time with God. The person who stands in holiness. Do you think that when Jesus comes, and God only knows when, do you think that He'll find you holy when He gets here? You know what that mandates is a constant inventory of your life every single moment of every single day. Question, do we do that? Answer, no. Are there ever moments in your life you're caught not standing for holiness? Are there ever moments in your life where that happens? Interesting thought, isn't it? I suggest we stand in awe and knock it off and stop sinning. And haven't we been told this? This is the classic passage in Ephesians chapter 6 where we read this word a couple of times in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11 and verse number 13. Talking about the armor of God, right? Ephesians 6. Verse number 11. The Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? To stand against. Yes, you've got to stand against the wiles or tricks of the devil. Uh, down to verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to what? To stand. So, whether you like it or not, um, you may not stand like you should in the evil day. But my Bible says in Romans chapter 14, look at this passage and we're done. We're all going to stand one day. <laughs> yes, we are. We're all going to stand one day whether we like it or not. And where is that? The judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse number 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all what? Stand. We're going to stand, yeah, that's right, before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us are going to stand. I suggest we get used to standing now. Sitting hungry and standing holy. Because that's exactly what God's going to do at the judgment seat of Christ with fire. All the works will be tried by fire to see of what sort they are. And all that wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up and gone. And all that gold, silver, and precious stone to the heats of fire will be um, purified and, and strengthened and established so that uh, the church is prepared to marry its, its, its groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to stand, uh, you know, pardon the expression, hand in hand with the groom someday. And... We've got to stand there holy uh, in fine linen, white and clean. So um, we only got to the second thought. But that's all right. We'll, uh, we'll pick up some more next time. Uh, we'll talk about uh, walking and running next time. We, stand, we, we sit hungry, right? We stand holy, right? How do you think we're going to walk? I'll let you figure that out. I'll give you a cue, a little cue there. Micah 6, 8. I'll leave you go with that. Hey, thanks for watching from home tonight. Hope you had a good time. I enjoyed myself this evening and uh, hope you enjoyed yourself as well. Uh, very grateful for all of you. And uh, we'll be praying for the live stream audience tonight when we let you go shortly. 
and you pray for us as well. Um, time has quickly gone by this evening, but we had a good time in God's Word tonight. Remember Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. He that turns his ear from hearing my law, even his prayer, shall be abomination unto me. God wants us to hear from him, and he wants to hear from us. And they go hand in glove, so don't forget about that. So have a great time tonight. Get a good night's sleep and uh, pray for us, and uh, we'll be praying for you. Thanks for watching. God bless all of you, especially if this is the first time. Good night.